to offer that leadership as the next president of the United States. My response to Joe and Kamala is very simple. You can't lead America if you don't love Americans. 250 years of this grand experiment are not going to be brought down by a con man from New York City. When he was president, he stood behind the stuff he promised to do. Hello, everyone. I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. Vice President Harris, former President Trump, both in North Carolina and Wisconsin today. Less than a week to go. Both candidates presenting vastly different closing arguments to the country. But first... The campaigns descended into something like a dumpster fire today over garbage comments. So who's the garbage man around here? Serious question. Trump world is outraged. I mean, really outraged that President Biden said Trump supporters were, quote, garbage doing a Zoom call with Latino voters. Now, Biden said he meant to say one Trump supporter, you know, the comedian who called Puerto Rico an island of garbage at Madison Square Garden earlier. After that joke, it's worth noting, J.D. Vance, Trump's running mate, said he was so over people being so easily offended. Well, wait, there's offense now. Garbage. Oh, my. Who would say such a thing? We're like a, a garbage can. We're like a garbage can. First time I said it was last night, gave a speech in Las Vegas. First time I ever said it, I said it, I don't know, it just came out, garbage can. We're like a garbage can for the rest of the world. So I ask again, who is the garbage man around here, and will the refuse of outrage be taken out anytime soon? Nancy Cordes and Libby Cathy join us now. I want to start with Nancy in Madison, Wisconsin, where Vice President Harris is heading next. So for the audience's benefit, Nancy, let's just play it out. Play what the president said and what Vice President Harris said this morning about this garbage issue. Let's listen. They're good, decent, honorable people. The only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters. His, his, his demonization of seen as unconscionable, and it's un-American. Let me be clear. I strongly disagree with any criticism of people based on who they vote for. It's, you heard my speech last night and continuously throughout my career. Uh, I believe that the work that I do is about representing all the people. Nancy, the vice president referred to, you heard my speech last night. At minimum, this has been an unwelcome distraction for her from what last night was a multi-pronged effort with tens of thousands in attendance to give the closing argument. Right. So unwelcome, Major, not only because we're just six days out from an election day and everything is so carefully choreographed over the next week or so, but also because you're right. They managed to draw 75,000 people to the National Mall yesterday, which is no small feat for a campaign, and that's what she'd like to be talking about today. She'd like to be doing a victory lap uh, when it comes to that event, and instead she has been asked at least twice already today by reporters about this comment being made by the current president of the United States, Joe Biden. Now, he did walk those comments back almost immediately last night as the White House... Uh, grappled with the reality of how these comments were being taken on the right. He, he went to social media, or his aides did, and said he was not referring to uh, all Trump supporters when he used that term garbage. He was only referring to one supporter and his comments. Uh, and yet, obviously, Republicans have seized on this. The Trump campaign has seized on this in part because it is a convenient distraction from the controversy that has swirled around them for the past few days, having to do with that very same comedian and what he said about Puerto Rico. Now, Nancy, you know as well as I do, possibly better, that things that get reporters excited don't often get grassroots activists or people who attend rallies excited. They're focused on other things. It doesn't sound, from what I heard, right. can hear behind you, that there's any diminishment of enthusiasm at that rally. No, and this rally hasn't even taken place yet. The people are still streaming in. Uh, I've noticed, first of all, take a look behind me. Let me go this way at the sign, Badgers for Harris Walls. This is a rally that is designed to appeal to young voters here in Madison, Wisconsin in particular, and there are a lot of them. Madison, obviously home to the University of Wisconsin Badgers. There are about 
50,000 college students in this town. The Harris campaign wants to get as many of them to the polls on Tuesday as possible if it can't get them to early vote. And that's why they're bringing uh, some big names here to uh, this Madison Arena, in addition to Kamala Harris, uh, Mumford and Sons, Gracie Abrams, some members of the National are going to be performing here. Uh, so it's sort of a, a rally slash rock concert designed to get young people in this town excited, uh, paying attention, and voting. And Nancy, before I let you go, in the main, does the Harris campaign believe last night is still going to be a moment? that they can use in viral ways on social media and use as part of the closing argument, essentially a compressed stump speech, what we heard on the National Mall last night? They already are, Major. We've seen some clips from last night's rally showing up in at least one campaign ad. I anticipate that there will be more. When I looked up, uh, standing there on the ellipse last night, I saw at least four drones hovering, capturing the images of this massive crowd stretching from the ellipse all the way to the Jefferson Memorial. And I think you'll see that video showing up on social media, showing up in TV ads over and over again between now and Election Day. Nancy Cordes, thank you very much from Madison, Wisconsin. Want to bring in Libby Cathy now. Libby, uh, control room, right? We're going to Libby? Yes? OK, there you are. Hello, Libby. Good to see you. Uh, let me, where are you and uh, give me your sense of the day. Good to see you, Major. I'm in the suburbs of Raleigh, North Carolina, but earlier today I was in Mount Hill, North Carolina, where we saw former President Donald Trump continue to seize on that comment from President Joe Biden last night. And as you and Nancy just laid out for us, it's up for interpretation what Biden meant there. The Biden White House and Biden himself saying that he was talking about one singular supporter, comedian Tony Hinchcliffe, speaking ahead of Trump at Madison Square Garden when he compared the island of Puerto Rico to a floating island of garbage that's offended a lot of people. Now, Trump jumping on Biden's comment last night and saying he was talking about all of Trump supporters when he said that this Trump supporters, where is that apostrophe, but said they were garbage. Biden, or excuse me, Trump telling that arena I was in today that Biden and Kamala Harris and Tim Walz think of them as garbage. This seemed to really motivate the base. Even before Trump arrived, talking to voters there, they said they already knew about this. They were calling themselves trash, similar to in 2016, what we heard with Hillary Clinton in deplorables. Now, this obviously didn't come straight from Kamala Harris herself, but Biden, or excuse me, Trump, tying Kamala Harris to this, saying it's Harris and Tim Walz's rhetoric that led Biden to say this. He says that Trump supporters have been treated like garbage, and that's an extension of this. Now, I will say that ahead of Trump at that Madison Square Garden rally, it wasn't just Tony Hinchcliffe who said offensive comments. Uh, there were other speakers who called Democrats uh, degenerates who said that they should be slaughtered. So we're definitely seeing an escalation of this rhetoric with six days to go. But former President Trump's campaign fundraising off Biden's comment and is not going to let this go as the controversy is now kind of off them and they're putting it on President Joe Biden major. Or certainly trying to at least equalize the controversy lamp, whatever direction that might be heading in. Libby, you're in North Carolina, crucial state on the map come election night. And a couple of months ago, thought to be in the Trump inner circle, safely in their camp. Not so much anymore. Clearly competitive. The former president wouldn't be there if there wasn't some level of concern about putting North Carolina again on the board as he did in 2016 and 2020. Absolutely, Major. And this visit today came after last week three stops in the western part of the state. So this used to be a very secure state, Republicans were thinking, having won it last time, Trump, the last two cycles. But now, with Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson at the top of the statewide ticket for Republicans running for governor and the controversies that have swirled him, now Republicans are not so sure. So that is why, as you point out, you see former President Trump coming to this state. Maybe he will be back here next week, but with six days to go, obviously, time is very limited. But he is trying to get uh, voters here in the suburbs, the suburbs of 
of Raleigh, like where I am and like where Vice President Kamala Harris was earlier today. Both these candidates crisscrossing each other in North Carolina, where I am, and now in Wisconsin this evening. So with six days to go, there's really no time to waste. They're trying to get every last undecided voter, but with millions and millions of Americans already have voting major, as we've talked about, we'll see how many votes there really are for them to get. But they're going to go after all of them, as we know, Major. They're going to go after every single one of them. Libby Cathy in North Carolina, thank you very, very much. Here's an invitation. Please watch Election Night with CBS News team live from our election headquarters in New York and with our teams who will be all over the country covering this race. Join us for real-time results, analysis, and exclusive polling. Coverage starts at 4 p.m. Eastern on CBS News 24-7 and at 7 p.m. Eastern on CBS. A new CBS News poll finds Pennsylvania Democratic Senator Bob Casey narrowly leading in his bid for re-election. Casey is ahead of Republican Dave McCormick, according to our survey, by six points. Casey also running ahead of Vice President Harris, who, according to our survey, deadlocked with former President Trump. 62% of voters describe Casey's views as, quote, reasonable. Nearly half say McCormick's positions to their way of thinking are extreme. We've already begun to see false claims of voter fraud or some kind of voting irregularity in Pennsylvania. How former President Trump might, emphasize might, be laying the groundwork to challenge election results if he is unhappy with them. We'll speak with the Philadelphia area Democratic Congressman Brendan Boyle. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Voters in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, that's just north of Philadelphia, now have until Friday to apply for or receive a mail ballot after the Trump campaign filed a lawsuit alleging some who sought a ballot were briefly turned away. Our own Natalie Brand has all the details. Major, as you know, Bucks County is one of the most competitive and critical swing counties outside Philadelphia here in Pennsylvania. The voters here are divided, but they're also equally eager to get their votes and ballots in early. And that's why yesterday outside of this county building, there were lines around the block on what had been the last day to fill out an application for an absentee or mail-in ballot. The county says it was taking about 12 minutes to process people inside the building. So many people were left waiting. They were frustrated by the situation. Voters we talked to say it appeared as though the elections workers were just overwhelmed by the crowds that they experienced. Well, the Trump campaign sued, saying that people were turned away ahead of the deadline. And today, a judge uh, sided with uh, the campaign and ruled that the deadline can be extended for people to apply for a mail-in ballot through November 1st, through close of business on November 1st, that is Friday. County officials here are expecting long lines once again, uh, as the message of vote early seems to be resonating with people trying to do just that. Back to you. On the scene for us, Natalie Brand, thank you very much. The Bucks County Board of Elections Office released a statement just a few moments ago saying in part, quote, in accordance with today's court ruling, we are pleased to be able to offer additional days for those who are still seeking to vote on demand. Democratic Congressman Brendan Boyle joins us now from Capitol Hill. He represents Pennsylvania's second congressional district. Congressman, good to see you. Uh, your reaction to the 48 hours that have just passed in Bucks County and the legal challenges and resolution thereof. Well, it's great to be back with you, Major, in Bucks County. It happens to be just right above my district, uh, all of uh, a few minutes from my house. It is a county that's very much a swing one in suburban Philadelphia, though I'd point out Joe Biden won it and won it fairly decisively in 2020. I expect it to be close in 2024. I have to say, however, I, I find this new position of the Trump campaign rather confusing after spending years and years of bashing uh, mail-in voting, calling it fraudulent, alleging ballots were coming uh, from China or from Italy, if you recall, and all over the world. Now, suddenly, they actually want deadlines extended, um, even though the reason why we have that one week before Election Day deadline is because the Republican-controlled state legislature in Pennsylvania mandated it. So the reality is there's no consistency with Donald Trump. 
There's no consistency with his campaign except for this. He either wins the election, any election, or any election in which he loses, he alleges fraud, whether it was the 2020 presidential campaign or even going all the way back to the 2016 Iowa Republican caucuses that he lost to Ted Cruz. Any race that he has ever lost, he has said he has cheated and that it was fixed. The reality is Donald Trump is lying and has continued to lie all the way throughout the last decade of his political career. And it appears this has all been resolved. And what was, according to Bucks County officials, and I covered them in the 2020 campaign, I found them to be responsive and very oriented towards serving the public. There was a huge line. There was a miscommunication about whether or not you could still stand on that line. But even those who were told they couldn't were given the procedures in order to either obtain what they came to or cast their ballot. So miscommunication now resolved your overall assessment. Yeah, you know, as depressing as the big lie was in 2020 and the shameful insurrection that was incited by former President Trump on this very building, I will say if there's an inspiring message from the whole 2020 saga, it is the way so many Republican appointed judges, as well as local Republican uh, elections officials, including Al Schmidt in Philadelphia and those election officials uh, throughout PA, uh, really went against their party's interests and went against the president of their own party to do the right thing. It was a situation in which the system held more than 60 lawsuits were filed by Donald Trump. Many of them were in front of Republican appointed judges. He lost every single one of those lawsuits. I just am keeping my fingers crossed that the system will prove as resilient in 2024 in dealing with his fraudulent claims as it did in 2020. How does Pennsylvania feel to you, Congressman? You know, um, about uh, nine months ago, even when we had a different Democratic presidential nominee, uh, I said I thought Pennsylvania was destined to be 50-50. It was roughly a 50-50 race in 2016, decided by under a percentage point. It was roughly a 50-50 race in 2020, decided by one percentage point. And I think we're, we're right uh, smack dab, even with a different Democratic presidential nominee, even with everything that has happened this year, I think that Pennsylvania is almost predetermined to be a one point or less race. Our poll has it 49-49, as you know, but our Senate poll has Senator Casey up six points. Do you find it difficult to reconcile those two sets of numbers? Six points, to be candid. Um, look, I'll take a one-point victory in both. Uh, and Bob Casey has been a great uh, United States senator, comes from a legendary political family in Pennsylvania. But I think, uh, I think both sides would tell you that six points in either the presidential or Senate race sounds very high to me. I've always thought that Senator Casey would run a few points ahead of uh, other Democrats running statewide. I still expect that. So I would expect him to win and probably do about two to three points better uh, than other Democrats who are running statewide for the first time in PA. Congressman, several Democrats I've talked to in Pennsylvania believe that the outcome of the state writ large will be found in Bucks County, Chester County, Delaware County, and Montgomery County, those counties wrapping right around Pennsylvania. And they expect, if Kamala Harris is to succeed, a huge run-up of the vote total there. Is that your expectation as well? Well, you know, in a one-point uh, election, just like a one-point um, game in sports, any one of a number of things, any one of about 100 things could end up, in retrospect, making the difference. Um, so all of these counties matter. All of these demographics matter. Uh, if you are on election night, though, just looking for one or two counties to focus in on and give you an idea of how the state is going, I agree. I, Bucks is one of the ones that I would look at. The other one that I would look at is Erie County, mm -hmm. which is hundreds of miles away, closer to Cleveland than it is to Philadelphia. It is one of those, is one of only two counties that Donald Trump won in 2016 and then Joe Biden won in 2020. I think the combination of those two, one in the suburbs of Philadelphia, one in northwestern PA, will give you a pretty early uh, indication of where the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is going. And I'll add Luzerne and Lackawanna counties to that as well. Congressman Brendan Boyle. Very much thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Republicans pounce after President Biden appears to use the word garbage to describe Trump supporters. Our reporters pounder, 
panel will weigh in on that and many other topics. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. I would never um, insult the good people of Pennsylvania or, or, or any Americans, even if they chose to support a candidate uh, that I didn't support. Do you think the president needs to come out and clarify that comment? Well, I, I think President Biden will decide what he wants to say. It, it's certainly not words that I would choose. Not words I would choose. That was Pennsylvania Democratic Governor Josh Shapiro responding to a comment made by President Biden yesterday. Seemingly calling Trump supporters, quote, garbage. Worth noting, the White House says the president was only referring to the comedian who made disparaging remarks about Puerto Rico at Trump's Madison Square Garden rally. And there is a massive search all over the nation's capital for an apostrophe. Jasmine Wright and Shelby Talcott join us now. Jasmine covers politics for notice, and Shelby covers that same beat for Semaphore. You were, thank, thank you for laughing at my joke. <laughs> it time. was funny. Okay. <laughs> This falls to me, Jasmine, into the classic category of I'm a politician who has a problem. Ooh, another politician is helping me solve my problem. Mm -hmm. So the Trump campaign jumps on this in try, trying to quiet the uproar from Madison Square Garden to equalize or maybe getting a slight bit of edge. Yeah, and let's be very honest, the comments are not equal, right? Uh, saying that Puerto Rico is a garbage uh, garbage island in the ocean or whatever he said, that's pretty racist, right? Saying that all of Trump supporters are garbage, not very kind, but certainly not the same as racist. Still, though, Major, this is not something that the vice president wants to be talking about six days out. It's just not. She wants to be talking about that rally yesterday where she tried to deliver a closing message telling Americans that they just don't have to choose Trump. It doesn't have to be that way, that they can choose an alternative, meaning her, somebody who she believes has a better temperament to be uh, commander in chief. So this is not something that the vice president wants to talk about. I'm certainly, this is not something that President Biden, who, even though he kind of put his foot in his mouth, is somebody who we know wants a vice president to win. Mm -hmm. That's just not what the campaign wants to be focused on. I talked to one uh, operative close to the vice president who basically sent me a meme of her in 2019 saying, dude, got to go, because this is this is a distraction. And it takes away from the economic message that she wants to be talking about, takes away from the message of unity that she wants to be talking about, and it takes away from the message that she is not the chaotic one on the trail. And so... You know, it's a big distraction for her. Uh, she kind of uh, uh, didn't necessarily, uh, she distanced herself from the uh, president, sure, didn't necessarily criticize him, um, and then tried to move on, and then you've seen her on the trail today. Shelby? Yeah, I think uh, I, it is natural that the that Donald Trump's campaign is jumping on this because it, Kamala Harris, for the past few days, has had a very good news cycle with the Puerto Rico mm -hmm. comments. This Absolutely. has been a positive news cycle for her. It is not something that Donald Trump's campaign has wanted to talk about. When I've talked privately to people on Donald Trump's campaign, they have conceded that, yeah, it was probably a bad idea to have this edgy comedian open for Donald Trump on what it was supposed to be his big closing message ahead of the presidential election. So when they saw this instance, of course, they're going to jump on it. They're making it into a big deal. I would expect to see it maybe in some last minute ads even sure. because it has shifted the news cycle away from at least a little bit away from those Puerto Rico comments. And you mentioned, Jasmine, the economy. I just want to read from a Reuters lead today. Directly quoting Reuters, the U.S. economy grew solidly in the third quarter with consumer spending increasing at its fastest pace in one and a half years, and inflation slowing sharply, continuing to defy forecasts of doom and outperforming its global peers. In case anyone cares <laughs> about the economy, today's data, again, on the upswing, or certainly looking positive. Harris, I'm sure, wants to embrace that, yep. wants to drive that, wants to also contrast that with the other messaging on the campaign trail. Yeah, it's a gift for the vice president and her campaign. I saw on Twitter today that uh, gas in Milwaukee in Wisconsin, a battleground state, is about 280. That's a huge boon for the campaign. But of course, they have to continuously kind of walk this fine line with not talking too much about all these economic indicators that maybe people don't even understand how it impacts their paychecks, saying that they're so good versus the reality that people are seeing these high prices and it has a negative impact on how they view the current administration and how they view the vice president and her campaign. And so I think you hear her talking about it. I talked to one person yesterday at that speech in D. 
D.C. And they said the point of this speech, yes, it's to give the closing argument. Yes, it's to put some distance between her and Trump saying that America has a choice. But it is also to personalize the issues that Americans are facing. That's why you saw her talk about, yes, democracy, but also talk about the economy, also talk about immigration, trying to really personalize what she wants to do for the country, trying to show the country who she is and who she would be as a, as a president. And so I think, yes, these economic indicators are very good for the vice president, but it comes down to how is she going to actualize and tell people mm -hmm. why they're very good for her. Shelby, you wrote about how the Trump inner circle views the metrics. The metrics flow through masculinity. And I want to play for both of you a soundbite from former rival to former President Trump, Nikki Haley, on Fox about the emphasis on masculinity. This bromance and this masculinity stuff, I mean, it, it, it borders on edgy to the point that it's going to make women uncomfortable. You know, you've got affiliated PACs that are doing commercials about calling Kamala the C-word, or you had speakers at Madison Square Gardens, you know, referring to her and her pimps. That is not the way to win women. Shelby, is there any concern within the Trump inner circle that their bromance with bros might be going too far? Yeah, I've heard a few people who are questioning it, but by and large, this is the strategy. This is what they believe is going to, to be successful. To change the face of the electorate. Exactly. They are focusing on primarily males. And now I've heard arguments from the Trump campaign that they're really focusing on everybody because their message is about the economy and it's about crime and it's about immigration and that's things that, that everybody cares about. But when you look at what the campaign has done over the past few months, the podcasts that they've gone to, which is primarily viewed and listened to by men, when you look at the speakers that they have at their rallies, it is very clear that they are targeting that specific Group. And what's notable also is I spoke to Donald Trump's uh, political director yesterday, James Blair, and he pointed out that there is a group of persuadable voters that they are targeting. And those persuadable voters, in their eyes, are a group of largely males under 50 who are mostly white, but there's also about a quarter who are black and Hispanic. But what is notable in that is, of course, this is a largely, not all, but largely male group of persuadable voters. And are they first persuadable? And second, are they so persuadable they actually show up and vote? To be determined. Shelby Talka, Jasmine, thanks so very much for your time. I appreciate it. Can radio help sway Latino voters this election cycle? It's becoming kind of a new battleground for political messaging. We'll speak with journalist Soledad O'Brien about all of that next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Thanks for staying around with us. It's no secret Latino vote and voters could have a big voice in who our next president is. Now a new documentary is going inside the effort to reach Latino voters via a kind of retro technology, radio. Latino radio gets particular attention from the Democratic Party, where the majority of Latinos traditionally land. Though data suggests they are slowly losing voters to the GOP. Latino Americano for Trump. Radio is huge in Latino communities. According to Nielsen, 97% of Latinos tune in every week to listen to Latino-focused radio or Spanish language radio. They listen to Latin music, gossip, sports, news, plenty of opinion, and politics. Soledad O'Brien joins us now via Zoom from the Beige Room. Uh, she is host of Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien and the producer for War on La Radio. Uh, Soledad, it's great to see you. You went to Pennsylvania, which is super important. 7% registered voters there, Latino. Talk to me about this week in not only this larger conversation about what's going to happen in Pennsylvania, but to Latino voters specifically. Yeah, it really centers around the importance of the Latino vote, which is really what we wanted to explore in our documentary. I mean, imagine 97 percent of a community listen to the radio every single week. And that's partly because of the jobs that working class uh, Latinos hold, right? L Latinos over index in um, America's working class. So you're looking at, you know, 38 percent of maintenance workers, 36 percent of construction workers, 27 percent of folks who prep food, 78 percent of farm workers. All those jobs you might note are kind of often have the radio going on in the background. And so both on the Democratic side and the Republican side, there's been this kind of war over the radio waves in order to try to get the Latino vote. We were very interested in the wake of all that has unfolded in the past couple of days in what will the impact be on the Latino voter, because the voter is really, really important. U.S. Latinos account for 50 percent 
of new eligible voters. 70% of Latinos who are polled say they're going to vote. And once they're registered, the number of Latinos who vote is between 80 and 88%, right? So this mythology around Latinos don't vote, true until they're registered, then they really do vote. So the big question is, how will these comments really impact voters? We spoke to a, um, a DJ, uh, Victor Martinez has a, is a DJ on La Mega, and he, he calls it a gift from God, basically, Donald Trump's comments, saying that he basically thinks, listen, there's half a million uh, Latinos of Puerto Rican descent in the state of Pennsylvania, where La Mega is based, and he's like, you couldn't ask as a Democrat for anything better. I have a couple of folks who are in the dock who are on the West Coast, Nevada, swing state as well, who said it's not really resonating quite as much in Nevada. Uh, Steve Sanchez, who's a radio host in Nevada, said, you know, the, it, people are kind of the people he's talking to who listen to his show and he skews right to the right uh, would say that they, they they're kind of laughing it off, that they don't think it's as serious as opposed to folks who are more on the East Coast and in the state of Pennsylvania. So an impact for sure. And so that briefly, Latino is an umbrella term, but it's a diaspora. And you mentioned Puerto Ricans, those of Mexican descent, Guatemalan, Dominican. I mean, it's a Cuban. lot. Cuban, right. Walk us through that briefly. Yeah, so I think that it is this overall term. But what's been very interesting to see in some of the early, um, sort of early polls, which of course, as you well know, are not always super reliable, is that even though the comments were very disparaging, racist, I would say, toward Puerto Ricans, there are lots of Latinos who would say, well, this actually is impacting them as well, that they feel like um, Mike Madrid, who's a, who's a consultant often for the Republican Party, would say, you know, we feel like it is an, it impacts Latinos as a whole because they, they see themselves in that insult, even if they're not Puerto Rican. And I think that is a real risk to uh, Republicans in swing states. Remember, the margin of victory in those states is so small. The growth of Latinos in those states is so large and so fast, any even small impact could really throw a race, you know, one way or the other. I want to pick up on your reference to Mike Madrid, because you spoke to him about this movement of some Latinos toward the Republican Party. Let's listen to that. The Democratic Party is becoming a whiter, wealthier, more college-educated party. And as a result, the issues that animate that demographic tend to be far more cultural. Abortion issues, gun control issues, climate change, um, marriage equality. These are all legitimate, good issues. Most of them I agree with. But that's Almost not... Almost sound like a Democrat. That's, well, I sound like a Latino is what I sound like. Uh, and that we are neither Democrat nor Republican is what I'm realizing, is we don't feel at home in either party. The Latino voter is the moderate, quantifiably in both parties. We are much less hyper-partisan. We are much less extreme. We are much more focused on economic issues that we have typically identified with politicians in this country's history. And much less... Evaluate yeah, that for us, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, it's it's over the years I've done 50 zillion panels, um, usually about the Latino vote for every election that I've covered, and I've covered a bunch. And the way it would generally work would that you get called out, and it would be like Soledad and Maria Elena and, and Juan and Jose. You know, let's talk about the Latino vote. Let's talk about the uh, immigration. When actually what you find in lots of polling is that Latinos are very much like everybody else. It's actually economy. Like if you had to rank one, two, and three about the issues they care about, it's economy, then economy, then economy. Now, immigration might be a subset under the economy, but the economy is the real issue. And I think Actually, both campaigns often miss that. Mike Madrid would say, you know, that the, what you're seeing now is that uh, Latinos are moving away from Trump. Uh, and, and while they're open to be sort of courted by either party, uh, there's a lot of revulsion, especially when it comes to these comments. And, and it's going to be very interesting. I mean, really, you never can tell for sure until after the election and really analyze the results. Uh, but he sees a very, a very big impact, potentially. And so, that very briefly, on this idea of Latino men being a potentially important sub-constituency for Trump as he attempts to return to the White House, how do you evaluate that and some of the commentary that it goes along there, this subgroup, hostile to either socialism or communism or kind of oriented toward a strong man figure? Yeah, I think it's part of the idea that there is just, it's not monolithic. I think it's very easy to look at any sort of racial or ethnic subgroup and say, Blacks, Latinos, Asians, Pacific Islanders, Jews, 
But actually, there's a lot of difference and um, and diversity within that subgroup. So I would argue that actually, when you're talking about, for example, communism and socialism, you're actually looking at age differentials that are much bigger, right? The way a, a younger Latino would think about the issue of communism is very different than, say, someone like my mom who left Cuba, right? She has a very, you know, God rest her soul, she passed away a couple of years ago, but her take on communism was much, much, much different than her grandchildren's take, for example. So I think age makes plays a big role. And of course, there is a sense of, you know, what do, why do Latino men find Trump more appealing than Latino women? Again, I think we're going to have to wait and see how these comments, what kind of a role they play in the impact on voting by Latinos. Soledad O'Brien, great to spend time with you. Thanks so very much. My pleasure. So could the racist remarks about Puerto Rico actually have an impact on House races. We're going to take a look at several key contests and the fight for balance of power. You see it right there, Capitol Hill. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back. For the next president to implement their agenda, whatever its ambitions, it will probably be important to have their party in control of the House of Representatives. A small number of races could decide that very question. So I want to bring in some experts on that. Scott McFarland and Hunter Woodall. Hunter, you're here with me at the table. You're focused on at least one, maybe more, key races in Pennsylvania. Why? Well, I mean, Pennsylvania is a fascinating state, right? We know it's a presidential battleground. It's the largest electoral prize, you know, for the, in the presidential election. 19 electoral election. votes. 19 yeah. electoral votes, exactly. There's also three key congressional races in that state. And, and the, one of the ones I'm most interested in is Pennsylvania 10. That's where Republican Scott Perry is running for re-election. And this is somebody, he won by around seven points in 2022, but the Jan, the Jan 6 House Committee report called him, I'm reading here, one of Trump's key congressional allies in the effort to overturn the 2020 election results. He's got a lot of pushback for that. And he now has an opponent who's really running against, you know, both, you know, Perry's record on abortion, but also Perry's record on trying to overturn those election results and his role on January 6th and objecting to those results. And that's a key factor in a race that really could decide control of the House. You mentioned other Pennsylvania races. Any others that you are looking at? Well, there's also, you know, this is where Democrats are also on the defensive. They have Pennsylvania 7. They have Pennsylvania 9. These are two seats held by Democrats. And this is a tough thing because Pennsylvania is always a close state in presidential races. It was close when Donald Trump won it mm -hmm. in 2016. It was close when Joe Biden won it in 2020. So there's two Democrats. There's Susan Wild in the 7th Congressional District, Matt Cartwright in the 9th Congressional District. Democrats need to hold on to both those seats, really, if they want to, you know, not only retake the House, but even keep the current numbers they have. And if, for Democrats to do that, they have to hope they kind of can create some separation in the presidential race, because you see Donald Trump and Joe Biden, excuse me, Donald Trump and uh, Vice President Harris are spending so much time focusing on Pennsylvania, it's tough to create distance from either. So the parties need to hold and expand. Scott, you're looking at North, not North, New York for that very principle. What's going on there? Oh, I'll meet you halfway. I'm looking at northern New York. How do you like that, Major? <laughs> okay, so Scotty always saves me. He always saves me. It's about a half dozen toss-up or highly competitive battleground races in New York for the U.S. House. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's an awful lot because there are only roughly 30 nationwide. So if there's five or six of them in New York, the balance of power in the U.S. House could swing with New York alone. Let's start north. It goes all the way from Syracuse, New York, down through the very inner New York City suburbs of Westchester and Rockland counties. Pretty much everything in between either is or is contiguous to a battleground house race. Now, how is that possible in such a blue state like New York? You'll recall, after the last presidential election, under court order, the lines were redrawn and nobody was satisfied. They've made all these uniquely competitive districts that hug the Hudson River, and these districts, Major, have drawn combined millions of dollars in each race, in part because they're competitive, because the stakes are so high, Major. I mean, control of the House could derail or super charge a Trump or Harris presidency, but also because these races are so expensive. Try to buy an advertisement in New York City. You'll find out it's as expensive as buying a week's worth of ad time in a different part of the country. Look at that race right there. New York's 4th District. Anthony D'Esposito is a first-term Republican. He beat Laura Gillen narrowly in 2022. They'll give it another go. If you go to New York's 17th, 18th, and 19th districts, you'll also find newcomers. There's another first-term Republican, Mike Lawler. He won in a wave in 2022, trying to beat former Congressman Mondaire Jones. Go to 19. That's Cooperstown, the Baseball Hall of Fame, Binghamton, Woodstock. New York's 19th district has yet another 
first-term Republican. This is important, Major, because these first-term Republicans came in with a wave for the party. A wave could wash them out this year the other way. Because my verbal tick this afternoon happens to be north. Let's go north to Connecticut and the 5th District. Scott, Got help your me back, out. man. Northwest Connecticut. The 5th District is Danbury and Waterbury. There's a little too distant to be considered New York suburbs. This is another rematch. John Hayes won this seat by less than a point in 2022. A Republican hasn't held the Connecticut 5th since 2004. It's been a minute, but here's the thing. There's really no way of getting around this. Not so much who wins, but the margin here is important because it comes in early, Major. A bellwether of what's to happen next. If she overachieves, good signs for the party. If she underachieves, bad signs for the Democrats. Scott McFarland, we all like the bellwethers. Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania with Hunter Woodall. We thank you both very much. Next, what a difference four years make. As Americans went to polls under very different circumstances in 2020. A look back as we look forward to Election Day. That's next. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Does anyone remember four years ago? Probably not. Too traumatic, too uncertain, too painful for you, for me, for all of us. I mean, who wants to go back to that? Well, I did. It wasn't easy. To help, I did what we all do. Went to my phone to look for pictures that I took. This is Times Square, mid-morning, October 24th, 2020. Look, nobody is there. Times Square, unimaginably vacant, and yet vacant it is. This is midday, October 26, 2020, outside the Richard Rogers Theater, still showing the Broadway smash Hamilton. Makes me shudder to remember Times Squares. Like much of New York, the busiest, most vibrant, alive city in America, shuttered and scared. I'm heading to New York tomorrow to begin election night rehearsals. This is how I looked doing that four years ago. Yes, that mask, it carries the logo of my beloved San Diego Padres and all the futile dreams that come with loving them. But I digress. This is Ali Sanza, the phenomenal executive producer of this very program, wearing even more anti-COVID protection. Ali was working for another news organization back then. This thing happens in our industry. <laughs> just check my resume. The point is, it was a scary time, and not just in New York. On October 19th that year, COVID cases topped 40 million globally. And you might have forgotten this. Then President Trump was hospitalized for COVID in early October. And for all that month, his White House was basically a cauldron of COVID infections. By late October, 220,000 Americans had died. As we headed toward Election Day four years ago, the United States would register for the first time ever 100,000 new cases of COVID in just one day. Back then, we were racing to create a vaccine when everyone thought that would be a good idea. Clinical trials were showing progress, and two new COVID treatments had just been approved. Still, we were in the grip of a pandemic, and that grip was tight and deeply unsettling. We can barely remember it all now. Memory hold, like so much else. We've moved on, and for the most part, that's a good thing, because we were so desperate to move on from COVID back then. What we are moving toward is, in good measure, what this election is about. But as we await that verdict, I thought it might be a good idea to remind ourselves of how an election four years ago looked and felt so very different. That does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern.